First name? My name is Kathy. And your last name? Projackalo, and I'm president of the Boston Historical <laughs> Society. Um, tell me some information so, about that. What's happening here today at uh, Fredonia State? Today at Fredonia State is really a remarkable day. It's uh, a day of living history. We go from the Revolutionary War all the way through 1812. Uh, we have many different aspects, ranging from Native Americans to Harriet Tubman and uh, Truth being here. Um, we have both sides being represented. And it's a great way for people to learn history outside of books and outside of classroom. Uh, we started the day at 8, 8.30 this morning with school, schools coming through. We've serviced about 750 students today to come and check everybody out and uh, basically it was a year in review for them for their finals so it was perfect timing and from 4.30 to 7.30 this evening our event is open to the public we have food trucks for the event so they don't have nobody has to cook dinner they can just come on out and eat and have fun and get to learn about history and by having living history here and uh, we keep expanding year after year is nice because people are learning history hands-on and everybody here is an expert in their fields and they're open to questions and answers and clarification and it's just a lot of fun we have cannons that are going to be going off and muskets are going to be going off so it's it's, it's really fun some one of the kids today learned about uh, blueprints from one of our engineers he showed how the map that the map, mapping goes and the procedure behind that and then explain that's how the term blueprint came about and as an example uh, Jolene's here uh, home representing the home front uh, making butter um, which is really good <laughs> she has different kinds uh, we have we're graced with uh, three presidents we have uh, President Lincoln we have President Grant we have President Lee, and uh, then we also have our medic, who's uh, very knowledgeable, and he has the tools, and he can explain how things were done back in the day. And you know, it's just a great, fun event, and there's just so many people to come and just cherish the event. It's 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 great seeing everybody come together. Now, this is the first time for Donia State College. Right. Originally, we started out at uh, Hamburg Middle School in a classroom, and then we kind of through the years grew. We went from classroom to two classrooms to the school and then we took the school grounds over and then uh, two years ago we moved to the Hamburg Fairgrounds and that went pretty well but then when we were there last year it was a little we got crowded we were touching knees and we got the uh, basically this kind of fell in our laps and uh, you know, they invited us out and said, you know, we'd love to have you. And Fredonia's been awesome. They, I can't say enough about how much they've really helped and turned this day into a great success and make created memories. Do you think, so. do you think this is something that's maybe come back next year? Oh, we're already talking about next year and expanding, so, and uh, having more schools come out. So, it's going to be fun. That's a that, and that's a light charge because I already used up some of the powder. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that was uh, something. Mm -hmm. That was louder than I thought it was going to be as well. Yeah, it's about 350 men, and if they do a, a battalion volley, there's 350 muskets going off like that all at once, and you saw the the smoke that it makes. Uh, British soldiers are trained. This is the this is the uh, assault weapon of the uh, the 18th century. It can be loaded and fired. Uh, British soldiers are supposed to be able to do it at least four, t uh, four times in a minute. That's the minimum requirement for training. At that point, you're considered a trained British soldier. You can fire four times in a minute. You want to be able to do more than that. But, you know, just at that minimum standard, it says when I march the troops into battle and uh, we get to within 75 yards, fire the musket, and then load and fire four more times, uh, we have got 2,250 musket balls heading down the uh, battlefield toward an, an enemy that's only 75 yards away. Uh, it, you don't have to have a whole lot of those, you know, be hitting people. Even if it's not accurate and not 
going where you pointed it, you're still going to get a lot of uh, hits on the enemy. Yeah. And the British soldiers, the government spends the money on powder and ball so that the soldiers have the experience, which the French don't get because they, uh, they can't afford to do that for their army, nor the Spanish. Uh, British soldiers in the 18th century can load and fire more rapidly than any other army there is. They're, they're really the best army at the period. And of course, <laughs> the tradition has always been to have the best army uh, in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is the 64th Regiment of Foot, became the North Staffordshire Regiment, and then the Staffordshire Regiment is now the Mercian Regiment. So uh, everything is 64, and the regiments in the uh, uh, British Army in the 18th century have distinctive uniforms. So of all the British regiments that were over here in the colonies during the American Revolution, we were the only ones with black facings, because they had green, green facings of different shades, yellow, blue, red on red, a uh, number of different shades. So. Anybody would look at this man's uniform from a distance and immediately know he was a member of the 64th Regiment. And this is Grenadier Company. Uh, out of the 10 companies in a British regiment, one of them was a Grenadier Company. Every regiment had a Grenadier Company. Now it's like just the Grenadier Guards. Yeah. Yeah. And you're so busy eating ice mm. cream that you can't talk about your, uh, Go your, your kit here. Okay. So. Would you like me to eat your ice cream for you while you talk? Would you like some? No. <laughs> it's, 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 there's a lot of it there, actually. Uh, he has to have something to keep him going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, grenadiers, they, they, they throw grenades, or they used to. So in the previous war, the French and Union War. Well, in, in England, they'd call it the Seven Years' War. Seven Years' War. <laughs> um, they would uh, throw grenades. So. They didn't work very well. They were just a hollow iron sphere full of gunpowder with a fuse, like a, uh, you know. Small black cast iron yeah. bomb that would fit in your what, hand. What do you call it? Like the, the mouse and the yeah, cat? Yeah, the cat and the mouse cartoons. The, the cartoons, yeah. that kind of a bomb. They don't work very well uh, because they, well, they have to be lit. And so you, you, you would light your match. And this is, we'd have a slow match struck with a flint and steel. And this cord has been soaked in potassium nitrate. And that causes it to burn very slowly, like an ember, like charcoal. So it burns a long time and doesn't go out. And so when it got time to fire, throw your grenades, you pull out a grenade, take your slow match, light it, and then throw it. Well, if it's wet, if it's windy, that cuts down the rate of success. Uh, if it hits and bounces and the fuse falls out, it doesn't go off. And even if it does, it does explode. There's been a lot of fragments of grenades found where they uh, simply blew into two halves. Didn't really fragment, didn't work very effective. Yeah. And to be a grenadier, uh, because you were throwing a, a bomb, they figured the taller the person, the longer their arm, the farther they could throw a grenade. And so you had to be six feet tall to become a grenadier. So by the time of the American Revolution, they're not throwing grenades anymore, but what they're doing is they're uh, a specialized soldier. They're generally experienced soldiers who have been seen action before somewhere. Uh, so you're likely not to break and run. And they have these really crazy tall hats, which uh, make you look like you're seven feet tall. <coughs> and what the uh, grenadiers would do is they wouldn't generally fight with their regiments. They would fight as a brigade of grenadiers. So grenadiers from different regiments would be pulled together to make a brigade. And they would be in the front quite often. And if you were a shopkeeper who would come out with your militia because the, the British Army was near, and you see 300 guys out there who are like all a foot taller than you, or maybe it looks like two feet taller than you are, then uh, the idea would be that maybe, maybe you should go home. Yeah. So it's an intimidation tactic. So uh, the grenadiers are kept around for that purpose. Yeah. So if I'm in the French Army, maybe not particularly well trained, but I am a professional soldier. But I know that the British Army is better than I am, and I see that guy. I says, and those are the best guys, best soldiers in the British Army. And I'm five five, and he's seven feet yeah. tall. And it's probably a good idea to maybe fire one volley and then turn and run. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. grenadiers, and yeah. so the, the and the different hat because if I go to throw <coughs> a hand grenade, my hat's going to get in the way, but his hat won't. Yeah. There's a lot of other differences too. So the grenadier and light infantry companies. Uh, the coats had wings, wings on the uh, on the shoulders, which means that they're a specialized company. Uh, the major, if you look at the tails of his coat, 
there are black hearts on it, and on the backs of the, backs of the grenadier coats, there are flaming bombs. Uh, so there's a lot of little uh, The little bursting clues. bomb is still used by a number of British regiments for yep. instance, their yep. insignia. Yep. So it's, uh, there's a lot of little clues that you could tell that the person was a, was a grenadier, aside from the big hat. So, if you want, if you want to read the uniform further, uh, you can tell that what rank I was at by looking at the Good uniform. Afternoon. So, uh, you know that he's an officer because he has gold lace all over his coat. And every regiment had its own lace. However, my lace is is, is plain, it has no like markings bring our on drummer it. Over. The drummer's just covered <coughs> with the oh, regimental lace. He is lace. covered with our regimental lace. Come on over here. So this this lace is the black and red colors of the regiment <coughs> on the coat, and these are white. And so every sergeant in the British Army wears white lace. You can tell they're, they're a sergeant immediately. And I'm a sergeant that's actually working because I'm wearing a sash. So if you have a problem and you say I'm wearing a sash, I'm obligated to come and help you. But uh, if I'm not wearing a sash, I'm not working, and I may just tell you to go somewhere else. <coughs> the coats are very similar, but the, the, the uh, musicians' coats have a uh, reverse facing. So all, all reverse facings uh, well, let's see indicate you're a musician. Let's see if anybody wants to guess why we would dress the drummers in coats that are in the reverse colors. Why that different? They don't have weapons. Well, he's got a sword. <laughs> yeah, but that's really not a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to put him behind the musket line uh, in a battle, so he, he won't be seen, and they'd have to hit the guys in front of him before he could possibly get hit. Yeah. Get your drum again, okay? We're going to, especially since we got a couple of new folks here, we're, go, we're going to uh, rein, reinforce this. So we've got a couple of new folks here, so let's just sound sound the drum with a, a really stiff. Okay. And again, the uh, the patterns, as I'm showing you know, the simplest pat you know, patterns, when we first get recruits, we teach them how to do a right face and a left face. And there's a different command for every for drum command for everything the soldiers know how to do. And the first thing I'm doing is if I'm, I'm gonna assemble the regiment. You know, if there's a uh, word coming in, you know, the French are advancing, the rebels are advancing, assemble the regiment. I don't go shouting around telling everybody to assemble the regiment. I just have to find a drummer quickly and have the drummer beat out the assembly. That enables me to find a drummer quickly because he looks completely different than everybody else. Now, realistically, I'll have a drummer on duty close at hand. But again, you know, if, they, if they're off getting uh, a meal, you know, I can pick him out of the whole crowd and say, you know, there he is, you know, come over here beat the assembly, get the men all lined up. Uh, we'll beat to, he'll beat commands to have the ranks open up. I'll just tell him what I want done, and the whole regiment takes commands from him. You know, have, the, have the men open ranks, uh, have the sergeants inspect the men, have the men close ranks, have the, uh, the companies wheel by platoons to the left to form a column. He'll beat all that out, and the men will just execute it because they've been trained to follow the drum beats. I don't have to shout out all the commands. So completely different color uniform, to find him easily, and well trimmed, just because we're proud of him. So a lot of lot of extra lace to make him look dressy. Uh, raised in the regiment, so we have uh, you know, husbands and wives in the regiment. They have children, and uh, uh, a lad who's uh, intelligent, uh, you know, about the age of 12 or so. If he's big enough to carry a drum, we'll start training him to be a uh, a drummer. And he's our communications specialist in the British Army. And it's a lucrative skill. And it's, luc and it's lucrative as well. His father, if his father hasn't made corporal or sergeant, if his father's still a private, he's going to get paid eight pennies a day. And his son, and the father, you know, he knows how to use a musket and everything else. But this guy has to know over, you know, over a hundred different commands and uh, play them adeptly and be with the officers all day long. He gets paid 50% more than his dad gets paid. He'll be paid 12 pennies a day. That's a shilling in English money of, of the time. Uh, five new pence <laughs> since what the 70s. Uh, so you know he gets uh, gets paid more. Uh, if a, of course, to have a son, the soldier's going to be married. His wife will have a job. She'll be making a shilling a day too. So the wife makes 50 percent more money than than the private soldier does. And clearly, it's it's unreasonable that somebody, you know, a woman should be paid 50 percent more than a man. They should be getting equal pay, in my opinion. Don't you agree? Yes. I yes. Do. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Thank 
you. Hopefully he'll he'll not mutiny and take the wrong <laughs> drum <laughs> drum cadence. Right? A lot of pressure. Yeah. A lot of pressure. Well, he'll he'll go on um, to uh, go go from drummer. He'll go straight to being a non-commissioned officer when he's old enough, because he's been working with the officers and the non-commissioned officers. He knows that business inside and out. He knows all of the commands. You know, he's seen everything since he was growing up as a child. So he'll go right to corporal when he's uh, old enough to carry a musket. And he'll read and write because the, you know most of the children growing up on the streets of London and Birmingham and Plymouth uh, don't learn to read and write, but the regiments run each run a school for the children growing up in the regiment. So kids in, growing up in the regiment will all know how to read and write. And a lot of the private soldiers will go to that school with the 10-year-old kids so that they can learn to read and write as well. So he'll get a promotion with a pay cut. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, what's the ratio of number of drummers per number of soldiers? Uh, about one per 36, because we have 36 men in a British uh, company, and uh, each company has one drummer. Quite a few drummers. Except the Grenadier yeah. Company has a, uh, a pair of fifers rather than a drummer. Oh. Mm -hmm. So That's in the nice. regiment, we get uh, you know eight drums and two fifes. That makes our little regimental uh, uh, band for fife and drum. But uh, 64th Regiment was well known because they had a full regimental band in addition to the drums and the fifes. They had uh, uh, two men who played serpents, one who played English horn, uh, two that played trumpet, and they were uh, well known in Boston for putting on concerts for the, uh, the, the people who lived in Boston before the Revolution um, with the 64th Regimental Band, all dressed real fancy. Very good. Thank you so much for your information. It's great. So it, yep. it's a very clear paper, yep. and it's tr traced on with an India ink. Okay. Yep. India ink is a very heavy, heavy. black mm -hmm. ink, and um, it would originally it would take approximately six hours to trace one of these. So if you have a couple commanders out in the field, you need to yeah. By the time you're done tracing this, the battle's over. The battle's yeah. over. They're already gone. You have to start over again, and so. We originally, they would have um, photos were made of with the glass or the tin. You have the jugs. You have to take them with you. Yep. And then um, it was, engineers they designed a way of putting that all the chemicals onto the paper. And essentially, what you would we're gonna do one real quick. I, with the sun exposure dropping, hopefully it will work okay. But I will show you. What it looks like before going in, but I gotta kind of move a little bit quicker with it if I can get it out. <laughs> but yes, so what we would do is we have one of the uh, our engineers. We would draw out the map, trace it out. And then, after it's traced, we have the paper like this that's already blue. So what is, is, what is special have, about that paper? It would have, there's a bunch of chemicals that go into it. Okay. The captain can tell you all the chemicals. Silver right. nitrates, yep. um, a lot of chemicals that nowadays they're we not We don't even use anymore yes. because they're so toxic. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on the time of year, is the best exposure. So it, it, essentially now what we have is a big giant camera that's going on. The sun is penetrating everything that is essentially white and then what it's not penetrating is um, the black. So it'll go through a bath which would actually have um, peroxide and almost like a moonshine mix. And when the paper comes out Everything that the sun did not penetrate, yes, will get washed off. And the, what the sun does penetrate will essentially get baked on. And you will end with a map, one that doesn't have a coffee stain on it, close to like this. And I know we were, it's kind of like pancakes. Um, the first one usually is off a little bit, then once you get the sun exposure, you know, we, we, <laughs> we, we've had days where 30 seconds, we can put one on, hit the sun, pull it off, and it's good. 
and then in the winter time, it's going to be closer to about five minutes because of the angle of the sun and the amount of exposure that's getting. Um, I think he was running them about three minutes per, but that was back when the sun was a bit more on to us, yeah. So this may take a little bit longer. But um, we're going to take a look real quick. I just want to... I, we're gonna let, let it sit. Yes, I can. Um, so what we this is essentially this is a grappling hook. Um, if you need to get rope up into the trees and whatnot, this is what we'd use. These here are more interesting. These are a Keltro, and what it's used for is. It's considered dirty warfare, essentially. If you were caught holding on to one of these by enemy, you would not live to see that night. Because what we'll do is, I'll show you right behind you here. Any way you throw this, you always have a spike that lands up. And you're walking through, when you're walking through the weeds, you throw them in, especially when the trail narrows. If, you, if a soldier sets on this, it's going to be a hurting day for them. However, they get put off to the side, and everything moves on. The, the um, trail, the whole procession moves on. What you really want to hit are the ox or the horse. Because when an ox or a horse steps on one of these, they stop. They don't move anywhere. And so when you stop them, Everything behind stops with it. And I don't know if you've ever tried moving an ox, that is, that a lame ox, they don't go anywhere. They chalked it up. The old guys hit, you know. More of the interesting, this is our um our scientific kit. Um, when we do the surveying, we have the compasses, we have the barometers. The barometers are needed for determining altitude, the um, elevation. The, and um, we have in our engineer's book all the calculations as to how high you go up with the air pressure changing and the approximate elevation that you're at. We're going to take a look at this real quick. I want to see how well it came out. So what we're going to do, we'll flip it over. Yeah. I know our captain was having good luck with these today. Yes, you can already see it's starting to develop. So we'll run it through the bath. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> a good one, actually. They've been they've been coming out really good today. Perfect. Nice. And so essentially, what we'll do is we'll bring them over to the side here, hang them up and dry. So you're dragging it through. But this thing is made of metal. What happens to metal in the heat? It gets hot. And we would have lines of engineers creating these maps. And now we took a, a process that went from six hours of tracing one to the time that we were just here talking. They have a duplicate one. And essentially, your very first blueprint Xerox machine. You know. We'd be in support of artillery, so this would be a good way to place a cannon. Because cannons weigh, cannons are really heavy, and you're not going to get a bunch of guys to just lift it and put it in place. So you you uh, you erect this in order to to do a, an easy you know easier job of lifting this. Uh, every wrap along along the pulley here reduces the weight significantly. So this thing weighs about 250 pounds with log. So you're not really going to lift it by yourself. However, with this apparatus, you can lift it pretty readily. And, you know, and then you could place the cannon in position. <clears throat> Pretty effective. Do you guys want to try it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, was, uh, <laughs> you can. Now go hand over hand. And when you release it, go hand over hand the opposite way. Don't slide the rope through your hands. It's a good way to get rope burned. I'll help you a little because it's still pretty heavy. You see how you can lift it? Not too bad, right? Yeah. Stronger now. <laughs> yeah. You don't take it all the way up if you don't want to, but now hand over hand on the way down too. There you go. Yeah. 
Yeah, they made it. They made You're up. You want to try it? Yeah, All right. My daughter would love your hair. She has blue hair. What do you think? You should have been here earlier when we were putting all this together. <laughs> Pretty good, right? Yeah, hand over hand. There you go. You got it. Let me tie this off and I'll show you the, the lifting shear over here. Use it to, to lift objects. However, what do you notice different about this than that? Other. It's, yeah, so it's missing what? It's missing a leg, right? So this is not a tripod. This is more like, we use more like a crane. So if you, we were building a bridge over a span and we had to get supplies out over to drop down, that's what we'd use this for. We could change the elevation by just letting this out, you know, letting the rope out. And it's basically the same thing. We just have a piece of rope on there, but it's a pulley, it's a very squeaky pulley system. But, you know, and we could use that to lift whatever we wanted, to basically to lower it down um, to a lower portion of a bridge, because we, we would be responsible for building bridges as well. <clears throat> Any questions? What was your first name? Dennis. Let me say your last name? Luthart. Okay, and you're with what? What are you part of? What? I'm with the U.S. Corps of Engineers, U.S. Okay. Army. We're regulars, so we're paid Army. Um, we're responsible for we would be dispatched in front of uh, infantry and or artillery units. Uh, our job would be to do surveillance and reconnaissance of train, uh, make maps for that. And we also have a, a map duplicator so we can uh, disperse maps to, to our different groups uh, so they know the train ahead of us. Um, we'd also be responsible for building defensive positions and battlefield obstacles in, in a battle situation we'd be more likely to grab an axe or a shovel as opposed to a rifle because our job in a battle situation would be to dismantle the enemy's defensive works. Yep, these would be some of the things you would grab for both construction and in some cases destruction. So you'd be both construction and destruction, so. Yes. Okay. Um, how important were you part of, the, part of that, part of the Army? Was that important? Were you important? Very important because uh, back in the 1800s, this would be all wilderness. Nothing was mapped out. So, you know, other than the very primitive roads that you would be marching on typically with your army, uh, the rest was wilderness and it was uncharted. So, if you're advancing into unknown territory, you have no idea what the advantage is. Um, say, for instance, you wanted to move artillery across a creek, you come across a creek, you need to know the direction of the flow of the water, you need to know the depth of the water. What's the, what's the creek bed like? Is it soft? If it's soft, then you have to build a floating bridge to move your, your, your artillery across. If it's not soft and you can roll them through the creek, that's fine. But what is the other bank like? Like if you get across the creek, do you have a position you can defend? Because the last thing you want to do is have to fall back through the creek if you get ambushed. So you guys were ahead of the infantry quite a bit. Yes. So you're just, you'd see the enemy before the, the infantry would, would you most of the time? Typically, yes. And we would be we would have infantry dispatched with us and maybe cavalry, light cavalry, so that we would have some kind of defense. You know, uh, we wouldn't be totally defenseless. And we do we do carry we would have this is an Enfield rifle, it's an 1853 Enfield rifle. So we also carry these. Um, this is an 1853 Enfield. This is made in England. Uh, weighs about nine pounds. It's a single shot uh, black rifle, uh, black powder rifle. It is a rifled bore, so it doesn't shoot a ball. It shoots a bullet-shaped okay. lead uh, projectile. Uh, very deadly. Um, and uh, the reason there were so many amputations in the Civil War is because they went to that. If that hits bone, it shatters it, so you can't fix it. Like a, like a lead shot, a ball will, will break the bone, but it won't shatter it, whereas a mini ball, as it's called, it's bullet-shaped, it'll shatter the bone. So it was the, bust, the ball first, and then that, that was the second thing? The ball was like revolutionary time, and, and the, I can show you one if you want me to get one. Yeah. I'll show you. So this is the projectile. It's called a mini ball, okay. but it's, as you can see, it's fluted, it's bullet-shaped, and that's because the rifle, ha is, it's a rifled barrel. So you can't shoot a ball out of it. Um, this is the cartridge that you would typically see. It's got the projectile in it, 
along with uh, 60 grams of black powder and some wadding. And it would typically all be beeswax coated to lubricate the barrel. And in order to load the weapon, you're going to tear it with your teeth, pour the powder down the barrel, insert this, and then pull the ramrod out to ram it down in until it stops. Wow. Um, and then there's a, uh, there's, a, there's a cap belt. The cap goes on here. Just a percussion cap with gunpowder in it. When you fire it, it you know it fires the round. The average uh, Civil War rifle, uh, such as this, is a uh, three-band muzzle-loading rifle. Uh, this is particular model is an Enfield uh, rifle imported from England, and it fires a 58 caliber mini ball. Uh, the mini ball is one of the first modern bullets in that it's conical, and it has. So to load the rifle, the soldier would start by reaching into the cartridge box, which is on the right hip and pulling out a paper cartridge, which has is a piece of paper which, has the, which contains the mini ball as well as uh, black powder. They would rip the cartridge at the top, exposing the black powder, and dump all that into the barrel of the, of the rifle. They would seat that bullet, which has a little bit of grease on the end, into the top, push it in with their thumb, and then pull that ramrod, which is a metal rod underneath the barrel, out flip it around and seat the bullet and the whole charge at the end of the barrel. Importantly, that soldier would then return the ramrod so that the uh, gun could be fired again, and then bring the gun about to the lock, put the gun in the half cock, which is a safety mechanism, and pull out a uh, percussion cap, which is a brass tube that looks like Lincoln's top hat, filled with fulm fulminated mercury, which is an explosive. Puts it on to a little nipple in the gun, which has a hole that leads to the barrel. Uh, the gun's now ready to fire. So on the command ready, they would pull the gun in the full cock, aim, and fire. So can you imagine that? Times the thousands. And uh, that's just one volley. My name's Neil Patterson. And you're with what? I'm with the Tuscarora Indian Nation. I'm here to talking about the War of 1812 and the relationship to the, uh, the nation, to the War of 1812 and how it came to be and what it was. And it's a whole different story than what's in the textbook. This is a book and it's uh, by Lee Simonson. It tells a little bit more about the history of Tuscarora books, I mean Tuscarora people in the War of 1812. It was a, uh, see most, uh, <laughs> There's been about 135, 140 books, according to the Library of Congress, that talks about in Tuscarora Indians. And there's only been a handful of them actually written by Tuscarora Indians, which means you get the wrong side of the story sometimes. <laughs> and uh, some of the stories that I have are, are told to me by the old people, like my grandfather's generation. For some reason, I ended up hanging out with my, the old people. <coughs> Excuse me, but it's uh, it, it was fun. I, I enjoyed growing up. I was bred, born, and raised on a Tuscarora Indian nation, <coughs> and uh, I learned from them, and they, they taught me stuff that, uh, like I said, is not in books, and it's it's kind of interesting to read what people write and the actual truth that the way I was told, and I have to believe them. So, because I, I, you know, they had no reason to lie to me. Uh, why would you lie to a 10-year-old kid or a 12-year-old kid? And so, that's what I learned, and I learned all that stuff as I grew up older, understanding a little bit more and more about our own culture, which is quite different than all the rest of the Haudenosaunee. And I enjoyed learning it, studying it, and it's pretty cool. Uh, the War of 1812 and the Tuscaroras. Tuscaroras, excuse me, Tuscaroras actually saved a bunch of people at Lewiston. They, uh, they were, the British were invading and the Tuscaroras says, you're going to get invaded at Lewiston. They're going to come in and invade you. Uh, of course, the Lewiston people said, Nah, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> but they did. And uh, on December 18th and 19th, the British crossed the Niagara River, what is now by Stella Niagara, with about 3,200 troops, depending on whose story you listen to or write, hear about. And they spent 200 to Fort Niagara, 
captured a fort, which is an armed fort, hardly a, not too reasonable, and they sent the other 3,000 roughly to Lewiston to take over an armed fort, armed village, you know, the village of Lewiston. But the Tuscarors had told them, they seen it, they actually watched over them and it came down off the hill. They, they set up a real good defensive thing by uh, setting fires along the top of the ridge. Uh, Lewiston's below the ridge. And it, it made like there was a whole battalion of people and there was only 30 or 40 of them, maybe 50 of Indians that were actually there to stop these 3,000 people. They knew they couldn't do it. So they did this. And this enough, gave them enough time for the Lewiston people to escape. And they did that. They didn't all escape. They, they don't have any records of how many people were killed by the British, let's say British Indians, because the British Indians were the first ones in and created havoc, burned the village, burned our village. And uh, our people went down and says, you know what? They confronted the, there's like 900 British Indians because that was the way they fought wars back then. They'd send the Indians in first, and <laughs> the Indians would fight the Indians. And the biggest loser in the whole War of 1812 was the Indians. And it actually came to an end. The end actually came in the Mohawk Valley in a fight where the Akiga chief was seeing what was going on. The Indians fighting Indians, and the British were behind them going, go get them. And the colonists were on the other side saying, go get them. So they says, you know what, we're fighting. We're fighting our own relatives. So they had a parlay and says, we're not going to do this anymore. And they, they said, well, if you're not going to fight, we're not going to fight. And they both went back and told their commanding officers, we're not fighting anymore, which drove them both crazy, the British and the colonists. And that was basically the end of the war. Uh, they fought other battles. and. Andrew ja Jackson fought down in New Orleans a month after the war was over and there was another fight even after that but that was the battle that basically ended the war because the Indians withdrew and they didn't fight it meant the British and the colonists had to fight and that wasn't so good for them so that was the end of that but we, uh, we, sit, we tried to save them and during the War of 1812 the Tuscaroras <clears throat> Although they had, uh, they were at peace, they actually ended up fighting in this war quite profusely. And even in Canada, they uh, fought into the battle of, uh, I think it was Chippewa. They fought into a V shape, and then they got on one side, or the British were on both sides. So they start shooting at the British on this side and that side, and then the uh, British. <laughs> start shooting at each other and they withdrew and said, well, look at them fighting back there, they're fighting each other. <laughs> so it was kind of a trick move that Tuscaroras had done. And they had done trick moves all through their history because they were so undermanned right. in these battles. It worked out pretty good. And uh, they saved the people of Lewiston in um, 2013, Lewiston built a monument and it's a, for thanks to the Tuscarora Nation, and it's down in Lewiston now. It's right, right in the heart of Lewiston. And they uh, made this coin. This, this coin is, uh, they call it their lucky coin. And you can go down there and buy this coin. And it shows the statue that is down there actually in Lewiston. And they have a, a little things down there where you can take your smartphone and put it up there. And it'll just, tell you a little story. I also wrote this book. Lee Simonson wrote this book, uh, Tuscarora Heroes, and that's prelude before we had the monument down there. It talks about the monument, but it tells you some wickedly sound, sounding battles. War is war. There are no winners in war. Just a lose. There's always, everybody's a loser. So. Uh, What's some of the things you have down here? Some of these things down here are wampum belts. And these are, these are a two-row wampum belt, and they tell stories. And this is uh, 
The taken in belt by the tusk growers into the Iroquois nations, League of the Five Nations now become the fifth nation. And this is a kind of an up to date belt. Even though it was hundreds of years old, it's one dish, one spoon. And what this represents is the Mother Earth here in white. And this is a dish, don't show a spoon, but everybody in the world gets their gets their food and water from the same place and this is what this belt's predict telling everybody you got to take care of the earth you gotta you can't do what we we've been doing in our generation and the generation before us so i'm hoping that these younger kids will go out there and find a way to dispose of the garbage that is mounting up all over western new york and all over the place you see mountains and mountains of garbage and it's all of us that are doing this. I think you guys or them guys, it's all of us that do this. This last belt is the latest of the Iroquois, of the Tuscarora belts. And it's given to the state of North Carolina. It depicts the Tuscarora nation here, wandering on down to North Carolina. Stayed there for about a thousand years, then one came back up to the Iroquois. And it shows that these, uh, what happened down there should never happen again to anybody because uh, in one day we lost over 900 people. I think it was 950, give or take, in one day in a battle. Uh, 17, 13, March 22nd, we were, we were trying to be peaceful, but it didn't work. So we had a war and there were 17, 18 maybe Indian nations plus the state of North Carolina and South Carolina again us. So we decided to come back up here. And just recently, uh, we've been going down there for you know, almost 30 years in North Carolina and we may build up better relationships with them. And they built a monument down there. Just out of Snow Hill, North Carolina. Wow. You see a big monument on Route 58. And that was our last stronghold that we left out of there on that day. So it's a, the Tuscarora Nation has been in war, didn't, not by their own choosing, but it's a, you know, one thing to get stuck in a war, it's another thing to come out of the war. <laughs> it's better to come out. And that's, that's some, of, some of the teachings that the old people say, tell us, you know. Like I was old enough to go to Vietnam, but I didn't. Got rejected, Yay. but I got rejected anyway. And uh, he says, "Whatever happens, I always live to fight another day. Because if you're out fighting the next day, who is?" Yeah. So, you know, those were the, some of the teachings that those old people used to tell us, and it was quite evident throughout history. That even though the Tuscaroras, and we keep track of all of those that have been in the army, the armed forces. And uh, so far, we've only lost a few of them, you know, ever since uh, the war, Revolutionary War. And we don't have records before that. <laughs> Anything else? No, that's it. Okay. Uh, what Mr. Higgin has there, I'll let him talk about what he has. Uh, this is a Pennsylvania long rifle. Um, it was uh, designed in 1770. Um, and. Uh, by uh, Isaac Haynes, uh, just outside of Philadelphia. Um, it is a rifle barrel, so it's got uh, the twists all the way down. So, so, say, do so you when you shoot a ball twist? out of it, it's like throwing a football. It's, it, it puts a spiral on the ball, it keeps it more true and accurate. Um, long rifles like this, you, you could shoot 150 yards easily. It'd be a very accurate. Um, a skilled man could even go even further than that, two to 300 yards with you know a rifle barrel. Yeah. So. Um, they, they are flint locks, um, so you know you once you put the powder and ball in there and, and ram it down, um, you still have to put powder in the pan and close the prison, and then you can cock it, and then the flint strikes the prison, creates a spark, which ignites the powder, and then ignites the powder inside the gun, which then. And that's a hopeful. Yeah. It's not a guarantee. <laughs> you know, you could have a flash in a pan, but none of the spark, you know, would go and continue in through to make it ignite. Keep your powder dry. You know, that was the thing. Keep your powder dry. You know, we're constantly, you know, dumping this out and putting new powder in and closing it back up behind there 
just to try to keep it dry. I mean, this was, you know, what kept you alive. For the so most if part. it didn't fire, you have to empty it out, dry again? Yeah, you, you empty out the flash pan again, dump it out, put new powder in there. And, it, you know, and if a lot of guys would have a, a small pick or just like a feather, and take the feather and, and you know, clean that out and try to get it to spark. If you can't get it to spark, if you got moisture way down here, the only way to do it, there's a ball puller you put down in there and hopefully that you can get that and pull it back out and not lose the ramrod and so on and so on. So, yeah, keeping your powder dry was, you know, the, the major thing, you know. Please. Yeah, this is a quiz for you. You know what kind of flag that is, or what flag it is? American. It is an American flag, but this is the Star Spangled Banner, okay? So a gentleman named Francis Scott Key was on a ship, in, uh, as it was a prison ship that he was negotiating for the release of some prisoners, and uh, all of a sudden a battle broke out at Fort McHenry, which is just off the shores of where he, where he was, or on the shores from where he was. And in the morning he got up and he still saw his flag flying and he, he ended up writing this, the, the poem, which is now our national anthem, about this flag. It's the only U.S. flag that has 15 stars and 15 stripes. It's also the only American flag that has the red stripe along the blue field. Because once they started adding states, they kept adding stripes and stars when they were adding states, but the flag was going to look really kind of funny, you know, because it would be out of shape. So they took and went back to 13 stripes, which is the original 13 colonies. And, and well, what happened was they had to add more stars because they were adding states. So they expanded the blue field to now touch the white stripe. So it came down this far, okay? And so that's why it no longer touches the red stripe. So they, they had some trade-offs in the design. But, but when you sing the Star Spangled Banner, this is the flag that they were originally referencing. Oh, did you go to Smithsonian? They've got. Well, I think the original is in the Smithsonian. Yeah. But if you go to Fort Niagara, they have a flag that's the same size that flew over Fort Niagara. That, yeah. And that's under glass. And that's, uh, so, was, did this militia fight at the Niagara Frontier? Yeah, they would have um, left Springville and headed north to yeah. help in the Battle of Buffalo or the uh, uh, Niagara Frontier, um, you know, the Niagara Escarpment. Um, it's, it's hard to say, you know, we, we, we have some records of men from the area fighting, but it doesn't really tell us where or when, you know, where they did. Right. Um, we assume because there was a militia and it was documented in our historical society that, that they went on to fight. Um, the settlers, when they heard the cannons, you know, you could hear the cannons from Buffalo in Springville. So when wow. the Battle of Buffalo was going on, they could hear the cannons that far away, the rumble of the cannon. They thought that the British were just going to wipe out everybody that was in settlements all across the frontier. You know, and it was, this was considered frontier, everything west of the Genesee River. It was still a very uninhabited area, except for the city of Buffalo and maybe Dunkirk and, and things like that. So, so they all packed up and went to Holland. There was a fort in Holland. So if you ever go down Route 16, just outside of Holland, just north of Holland, there's a there's a historical marker there. It, it, it's 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 about uh, Fort Holland, and it you know it was back in this farmer's field, you know, which you know they they still they were saying that the pylons from the fort were still there, you know, very deep, you know. But uh, it was an old wooden structure and it wasn't very big. But that's where the settlers all went to, you know. Escape the wrath of the British, which never really came this right. way from Buffalo. I mean, they they never came the, you know east yeah. of here, um, you know, really. So yeah. and after two years of battle, it was all done. The war was over. The lines between us and what is now Canada went back to the original. Nobody gained or lost any property yeah. or anything like that. It went back. And the the the, uh, the oddest thing that I had found is. Um, the Battle of New Orleans, 1814, we took a little trip, okay, the long little song there. Uh, it was our biggest victory as far as on land. You know, Andrew Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, whole stories and so on, don't fire, you know, until you see the whites of your eyes. Um, the war was over by two weeks. The treaty had already been assigned, but there's no... Yeah, there's no internet, no communication, so we have this huge battle and we're the victor, but, you know, yeah, we won. But, <laughs> yeah, not for the guys, especially the guys who perished in that battle, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, 
And we, for a new country, um, you know, we're fighting the UK, who was also fighting Napoleon at the same time. Uh, but our shipbuilders were new, our captains were newer in that. But on the sea, you know, the lakes, Great Lakes, the Atlantic Ocean, and that, we actually were the victor on, on water more so than on land, which, you know, didn't seem right coming from the UK. I mean, they had <laughs> centuries ahead of us and skilled captains and that, but we still, uh, we did quite well on the water, you know. But, Any yeah. questions? Well, I'm just working on a little hook, um, and we had the fire going real nice, and then we got called over to go to the cannon, so the fire kind of went out, so now I'm just keeping it going again. Um, what I'm doing here by pumping this lever is I'm opening and closing a set of bellows, which are inside the forge, and that'll force air from the top of the bellows into the bottom of the forge heating up the fire, just like a fireplace with a little pair. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what you said. Like these little guys? Yeah. Okay. These are about two pounds. The ones that are in there are about 150 pounds, so they're pretty big. There's actually two of them in there. So, um, This is kind of a cool piece because there's only about maybe four or five of these in the entire country. Uh, it took me two years to build. And what I'm going to make you guys is, well, it'll be a little bit bigger than this. I'm just going to make this little teardrop hook. Looks like a teardrop. So if you got about seven or eight minutes, you can listen to me talk. I'll make you a hook. So, so I heat it up nice and orange. I come over here, and what I want to do is hit it a few times on one side, and then turn it 90 degrees. And I'm moving my hammer a little bit that way also. And I'm bringing it to a point. All right, so I brought it to a point. That's called drawing, <coughs> drawing the metal, making it skinnier and longer, okay? So now I, I have to heat it back up to do the next step, which is actually... I just brought it to this little tiny point here. Now what I want to do is I want to take the square metal and make it round. Okay, so when you hang something on here, it's not going to poke a hole in it. So again, what I'll do is I'll put the metal and I'll hit it on these edges, and then you'll see me start to roll the metal. And I hit it really fast with the hammer, and that'll make this nice and round for me. Okay? But again, I have to heat it up. That's a right-handed hammer. <laughs> that was the other one was the left -handed. The other blacksmith that's here was left -handed. So we have our own hammers. I can't use it once. It wants to keep going to the left. You know what I'm saying? So I'm heating it back up. I mean, actually, if you guys want to go around the back and see the bellows, I got the back of that open if you wanted to look at them. You can't miss them. There are these big gray things back there. So what we have is, is that coal? That's coal in there. Yep, it's all coal. So you go and fill it up with air. Now, what I like to tell people, what I like to tell people, you know, and explain what our job is <coughs> during the Civil War, I like to compare our job to that of today's NASCAR pit crew. But I'm in the 1800s, 1860, 1860s pit crew is what we are. Because back here, I would not only be working, repairing items, but I'd also have about 10 or 12 other craftsmen here. And you can see how I rounded this now, mm -hmm. to round it off in here. 
Okay, let's see how the smell is. Okay. Now I'm going to put the little pigtail in there. That's that little curlicue. And again, that goes in the hook. So if you hang your hat or your purse or a dress or something on it, you're not you're not going to poke a hole in it. Okay. So yeah, I like to say we're the 1860s version of a pig crew. I have the guys that would be back here working with me would be, for example, the wheelwrights. Those guys knew all about wheels, how to change them, how to fix the spokes, how to work on the ferrules, how to put the tire on, all right? I have the barrel makers called the coopers, and those guys would be working on barrels, and a carpenter working on the wagons, which are all made of wood. I also have the farriers back here. Now, the farriers are really the guys that shoe the horses. I can shoe a horse as a blacksmith, and 99 out of 100 people will tell you, if you ask them the question, who shoes horses, they're going to tell you a blacksmith. But all those 99 people are kind of wrong, because the farrier actually shoes the horses. I can make a shoe, I can shoe a horse, but that's not my job in the Civil War. Okay, so there's my little pigtail, and now what I'll do is I'll make the actual hook part, but again, i to put it back in the fire because I lost the heat, okay? I lost the heat. <coughs> I was using your hand. Okay. It didn't work. It was left hand. Left hand. <laughs> folks ever seen the difference between the left hand and the right hand camera? I was going to ask them, but I thought... <laughs> you want to see the difference? Yeah. Okay. Johnny's is a right-handed camera. Now if we switch hands, you'll see the difference in it. So you see it. That's the secret, right? You know, you know what I'm saying, right? There's a the difference. Did you see it? You didn't see it? What grade were you in? So, oh, that's my seventh grade. So if you were in eighth grade, then you would understand. I'm a middle school principal right now, so I've been busting on the fourth kid. Sorry. <laughs> but he's been great. He's been great. So. Alright, so like I said, I, now I want to make the, the actual hook itself. So heating it back up. Now I don't want to ruin the pigtail. So what I do is I cool that pigtail off. And I harden it. Now I can use the horn of the anvil, which is this pointy part here. To make my hook. Okay, now my next step is I want to cut this off so I can twist it and then make the teardrop part. Okay. So again, gotta heat it back up. Now interestingly enough, most of these setups look like they're geared for a what hand turn. Because <clears throat> normally where I am watching the fire, I can pump this with my left arm. So I'm theoretically balancing my strength in my left arm with my strength in my right arm. My biggest problem is I'm left-handed. <laughs> I end up with dissimilar <laughs> arms when all said and done. And there is a process that John and I do called double striking, and that's when we're taking a big piece of metal and we need to forge it. I might have a 10-pound sledgehammer, and he has his 2-pound hammer, Wherever he hits, I would come down and hit in that same spot. And if you notice, he and I are not getting in each other's way because he's on the left side. It's the diagonal. It's the diagonal. That's actually a big benefit of double strikes. Now, we don't talk to each other during that whole phase. So how do we tell each other when to stop? So we're hitting. Now 
that's how he knows it's his last strike. I end up bouncing my hammer across the end. That's the way we communicate during double striking. Now, the reason you do double striking is because you're working on a very thick, very heavy piece. An example of that would be if you're working on something like a, a hot chisel, for instance, where you need to do heavy hammering. So when I cut this off, I put it on this chisel, but I don't want to go all the way through because I'll dull my chisel. So I go about halfway through, and there's a lot of different techniques. I know John likes to spin his sideways sometimes, but I just break that off. Okay? So you just got to break it off. The takeaway is with the thinner metal, you can easily take it apart. Now that he's got a much smaller piece, he's got to actually use the bombs to hang on to it because he's lost all of that material that he was holding on to. And the way he's going to try and hold it <coughs> is to go past the hook and to actually get back onto the body of the material with this specialized set of tongs called the wolf jaw tongs. And it's called the wolf jaw tongs based on the opening of the mouth and the, the throat on the inside. All these little weird things make it a lot easier for us to do our job too. You wouldn't you wouldn't think about this, but after you do this long enough, you're like, oh, I know that if I'm making a hook, it'll fit through here too. It just fits in there really nice. Now, normally when we're holding a flat piece, you'll end up using just the, the straight build tongs, and the reason for that is because it sits very well right inside the mouth because it's got the natural key cut out for a quarter inch size piece of material, whether I'm using round or square stuff. Okay. Did you ever notice blacksmith shops are really dark? And the reason is so we can see the color of the knife. If I put that out in the sun, you wouldn't be able to see that orange color. And we, we use the orange and the yellow and the red to will tell us the different temperature. Because what happens is the yellow light from the sun diffuses out all the coloration that we get to see from the temperature that this piece is trying to emit. When we're in the shade, we can see a lot deeper red colorations in the metal. We can almost see down to a maroon color. What we use those colors for is to indicate temperature to us. So we know that when we're at that bright orange color, we're somewhere around 1400 to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. When we're in the red region, we're around 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. As we cr uh, climb down to about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And then below that in the 900th region, you get black iron. Now black iron has no coloration to it. The biggest concern we have around the forge is always black iron. Because you never know what temperature it is from room temperature to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Many a blacksmith burns themselves not on colored metal. They burn themselves on black iron. never grab a piece of metal off the anvil. What we do is we put our hand over it, we kind of feel for the warmth. If we don't feel the warmth, then we can find it. You just never grab the grab this. You don't know the black metal he was talking about. It could be 300 degrees. It's going to get a real nice burn across your hands. And normally it's caused by the fact that you're distracted. You're trying to work on too many things at once because you have too many irons in the fire. <laughs> Can you tell we've done this before? <laughs> now, the term irons in the fire refers to any object that's actually in the fire pit amongst the coal. It doesn't have to be a physical piece of iron. It doesn't have to be directly in the fire. It's pieces in the firebox. So as you see over here, right now there are one, two, three, four irons in the fire. When Johnny adds his, there's a fifth iron in the fire. So we have to be conscientious of all of those. So now I'll put it in, I'll heat this up, and then I'll twist this. Yeah, we do got a lot of irons in the fire, don't we? Holy mackerel. Did your mom ever tell you that? You got too many irons in the fire? How many moms told you that back in the day, right? That means you got too much going on in your life. You play the trumpet, you want to play the violin, you're a swimmer, you're a basketball player, you're a soccer player. Now all of a sudden, 
drama club. have a girlfriend. Oh my gosh, it's crazy, it's right? Too many all right, too many irons in the fire. He's probably thinking, Mom, why'd you bring me this? <laughs> Are you kidding me? No. Alright, so we're looking good there. So now what he's gonna do is bring it over to his vise <clears throat> because he's got the main body of this warmed up. And he's going to do a decorative twist on the interior. The decorative twist is purely there, as I called it, for decoration only. It does not serve a functional purpose. It does not add structural strength. It does not enhance it in any way, shape, or form. What it does for us, though, if we had made that piece and it was off-center, for instance, like on our S-hooks that we made, if, a, if the hook was hammered off-center or backwards, we would spin that and twist it, and you would never know it was made off-center because we would end the twist whatever orientation we needed. Okay, so now we just poke a little hole in there or drill a little hole in there, and we can use that on the wall. So, story behind the teardrop <laughs> probably want to hear that, right? I mean, yes. if you're still willing to stay a couple minutes with me, we got stories. <laughs> oh, do we? <laughs> so the teardrop up. Here's my good one that's not hot. Here Johnny, I'm going to jump in the fire, all right? Yep. Thank you. The soldiers, as they were marching, they may come across an old nail, or maybe a piece of chain on the on the ground okay so they take this old nail to the blacksmith and they would ask them to make a teardrop hook and you can see we can make this into a teardrop hook no big deal right so then they pay me and John maybe a nickel for this they then would go back to their tents they go in their tents and they would write a love letter home Wife, to their, their mom, their grandma, a girlfriend, and then they would date the letter June 7th, 1863. We'd wrap this up, put it in the mail. In about two weeks, will you be my wife? Okay. <laughs> my wife receives the teardrop book. And it tells you two things. One, I am sad that I'm in this war, but I love you, I miss you, I can't wait to be back with you. And number two, because I dated the letter, you knew I was still alive. You're right. You are exactly right. June 7th, I was alive. And maybe it's June 25th now, okay? So now you take this, you hang this up, you put your bonnet on here, your apron, you know, whatever, dress. Well, on June... 11th, unfortunately, I get killed in battle. Sorry. I get killed in battle. So the good sergeant, who has the red stripes on, comes walking out on the battlefield to bury the dead, and he notices, oh, Johnny, Johnny's dead. So what he does is he takes off my wedding ring or my pocket watch or a necklace. He sends you another letter. Sorry, your husband's dead, died. And now what you do is take all your stuff off here my ring that you gave me on here, you put your ring on here, and now you're free to marry because you're a widow. Okay, and but yet you still have the memorial, if you if you want to say that, of the memories of our first marriage or your marriage to me. So that's the story of the teardrop. My name is Dave Schmidt. Okay, and you're I'm the a Rochester. I'm with Reynolds uh, Light Artillery. I would have been the leather worker. And my weapon would have been, I would have had one of the stations on the artillery piece, would have been my job. Okay. Give us some information from what your, uh, uh, your tools and Being stuff. the leather worker at the time period, my responsibility is to keep, there's a shot here showing we would have had 140 horses, 110 guys. My responsibility would have been keeping all the leather goods from okay. shoes, packs, uh, belts, whatever, to the saddles, all the tack gear, all the harness gear for the artillery pieces functioning at the time. Um, so my hands would have been filled just trying to repair stuff to keep myself and the army, my artillery unit, moving on the on the field of battle. So tools, uh, I do have, there's a couple tools that shouldn't be here, but most of the tools were your awls, your punches, 
um, different razor sharp knives uh, that are designed to cut through thick leather. Um, I have different hammers here, uh, different types of rivets that I'd be using, some brass, uh, some copper. Um, the, the, the threads that were used at the time were more of a very coarse needle and the main stitching used would have been what they call a um, saddle stitch which would be the examples basically two needles going through the same hole so if one thread breaks it's not like today's uh, loop stitch where if you pull a string on your coat it could fall apart on this if one thread breaks there's still another thread to protect the implement being a knife being a pistol being the saddle the last thing you don't want your saddles falling apart so it's a saddle stitch that they would use and when i'm teaching i try and do that this would be traditionally like the sewing machine at the time it's a set of paws so it's like my third hand that would hold the piece while i'm putting holes in it and stitching it now when i'm teaching i'll do different things i could make a pistol sheath i don't think i have one here uh, or it would be something like this, a pistol sheath to hold a pistol. This is a double rig for like a saddle, or I can make one that would go on the belt. Um, I just made, no, I put it away in another place. I just, uh, one of the guys gave me a bayonet scabbard that was falling apart. So I just refixed his scabbard. I have to dye it this weekend and finish it. We're going down to Gettysburg to teach uh, tomorrow. So that will be one of the projects I'll be working on there. Uh, I'm working, I'll be working on a couple knife sheaths uh, by hand with a saddle stitch. Um, you know, showing people how to design, if I have a knife, you know, how to design a pattern. I cut it out of the leather that I would have here, then start to put it together and stitch it like I would. It's kind of like making a box or anything else. You have a design, you put the design on your material, cut it out and start to either glue it, stitch it, whatever, uh, together. Because everything here, and in most of our cases, even the forge, was built by our smithy. He also built the frame for the last cannon. We have expertise where a lot of us were teachers or engineers. We know how to do things, and we try and teach that to the kids uh, or to the adults that come, how to do it, how to put things together, how to fix it. Uh, and that's what we, we, we try and do that today. So like the table, I made these tables. I made that box. I also have like a, I also teach weapons. So I'll have saber swords, bayonets, and I normally have 11 different rifles, I show them. And I have made a box to hold like a repair box. And it's just, it's again, it's the expertise that each one of us brings for teaching. We never know what's going to turn that kid or that adult on or off. So we carry different things to try and get their attention. Well, I'm here uh, portraying General Robert Edward Lee, who was the commanding general of the Army of Northern Virginia. Here with my two compatriots, uh, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States and General Ulysses S. Grant, the Commanding General of the United States Army during the Civil War. And we're portraying uh, these individuals today and appearing here together to symbolize the, uh, the reconciling of the nation following the Civil War when the hostilities ended and General Grant shook hands with General Lee and the war ended. So we're, we're trying to convey the message that the United States, as a result of that war, is, came back together again to solve its problems together. So. Yes, we had a fun time here today. We love doing this. Um, we should, that's why, one the of the reasons we were here. Um, <laughs> we also have more Civil War reenactors. Um, there were also participants from the French and Indian War and Revolutionary War. Um, this is a very good event. Very good event. We had a lot of students from various schools come through and a glorious, glorious day. And I'll turn it over to the President of the United States. Well, hello there, everyone. Anyway, uh, I portray Abraham Lincoln. I am one of 186 Lincoln presenters. Wow! <laughs> one of the 186 Lincoln presenters in my group in the United States. We have one from Spain and one from Alaska. So 186 Lincoln presenters. But I work with Eddie, with uh, General Grant and Tom as, as General Lee, and we help re-inspire re re the children about history. We, don't, we believe there's not enough history being taught in the schools, and that's part of our heritage. And these are things that are very important 
And uh, if you don't know your past, you're certainly not going to know your future. So anyway, uh, today we had, we had met people from out of the country. We met a couple from United Kingdom, and they were thrilled to be here. And uh, I, I met a fellow here from Rochester, and he understands that Frederick Douglass came from Rochester. So, I mean, it's just something. It's a melting pot of history, and because we are part of it, it's very re rewarding and inspirational. Is your first name? Okay, so my name is uh, Samantha Jacobs. I am a community educator for the Seneca Nation Language and Culture Department. I teach a lot of community classes. Um, I teach uh, traditional arts classes to a wide variety of age groups. Um, I currently work with teens and elders. Uh, first off, when I teach people how to do beadwork, I start with what's called a beadboard, and it teaches them the basic stitches to uh, do a variety of different projects which are your um, base stitches for doing raised work, flat work, and then um, bead embroidery. Um, so majority of the pieces that are on the table and that are on display are items that we have made in our classes through the department. So um, you'll find a majority of the beadwork on our regalia, our outfits, whether it's through beaded skirts and leggings or for guys with their breech cloth and vests. Oftentimes you'll find uh, the clan symbols on there um, indicating the clan of the person that is wearing the beadwork. Um, you'll also find a lot of the imagery that we use has a meaning. So for example, a lot of our oral history, some of our traditional stories, um, those are all kind of written down and um, put into beads. For example, the set that's right in front of you, the black one, that actually tells the creation story. So we have the sky domes of um, sky women coming down to Turtle Island, finding the dirt, uh, from the musket under the waves and then creating Turtle Island and like those kinds of things so there's a lot of knowledge passed down and the actual meanings of the the embroidery the beads and also I have some examples of tufting which is actually done with uh, either moose hair or caribou hair and these particular ones both examples on the mukluks and on the moccasins here they have uh, moose hair tufting so we would take a bundle of the moose hair that we cut off the hide We'd make a little loop in the material and we stick the bundle in there and pull it tight and it kind of goes and sticks up and then you just shape it to the petals or whatever uh, shape that you want it to be in. So, well, there's some fun examples. Because I'm Grandma Butter. Grandma gentleman. Butter. So what are we doing here? We are going to create a new batch of butter. And I'm using heavy cream. And it's going to take probably about two to three minutes to make. What was your station during, like, during the war, during that time? Kind of. So, were you part of the infantry or, or, or just a, a separate thing? This could have been a separate thing. At the time, the women did not have a chance to do anything to make money, but they could make butter and sell eggs. And that was the egg and butter money you hear about. But I tend to think the women did a lot more because during the Civil War, when the man or the husband or the brothers would go to war, they were left behind to run the farms. So they actually ran the farms. Uh, they could also mend clothes, they could make clothes, they could wash clothes. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of jobs for the ladies during that time period. They also would go and sometimes they would write letters for the soldiers if they knew how to write. They would read the letters the soldiers got if they happened to fall on the camp. Um, they would also, of course, help with the first aid. They would create bandages by ripping the cloth and rolling it up in rolls. Um, and they would make meals to give to the men. So this process, uh, how long is this process take? It takes two to three minutes to make it when it's room temperature, which is what you want. And it's going to make a whipped cream first because it's the same thing you make whipped cream, but when you do whipped cream, it's cold. And then after it makes whipped cream, it starts to turn yellow, and then it breaks apart and you have your butter and your buttermilk. Very, very simple. Now, where would they get the cream from? Cream, they could get it from the cows, they could get it from sheep or goat. Anything they could milk, the milk would make the cream. It's already starting to turn yellow. Yeah. 
how dark it is. The color depends on the fat and the heavy cream. The higher the fat content, the darker the yellow. Yes. When I get the slosh, then I know I've got butter. And there's your butter. And then, I got one of the higher, fancier churns. Mine has a spout on it. Otherwise, you would have to dip out the butter and then strain it. And what true buttermilk is, is whey or a very creamy skin milk, because you're taking all the fat out when you made the butter. Miss butter. No, he hasn't missed any. Oh, he didn't want that. Please. And then you're just going to squeeze out the remaining milk that's in there. And then you can add any flavoring. For today, I got garlic chives that I chopped up. I have a strawberry flavor, a salted caramel, and now you're plain. And that's all there is to it. You can put these in ice cube trays and put them in the refrigerator. They'll get hard. Take out one or two the night before and you have soft butter the next day. And that is all there is to it. You can do it in a jar. Fill the jar about a third of the way and just shake it. You get butter. If you want ice cream while you're at it, fill a jar a third of the way, cut in some fresh strawberries, vanilla, sugar, shake it about a minute, put it in the freezer, and you have ice cream in about three and a half hours. Wow. You can even do it as your coffee creamer, half condensed milk, half heavy cream, shake it together, you've got your sweetened coffee creamer. So you just have fun with it. Add the flavors and see what you can like.